So Greg is working for Draper, and he's also in the committee of the SDNA conference. So he is uh, leading a group on, let me get this right, on um, sensors and imaging systems at Draper. And he has a very long experience, I, I, I think 10, 20 years in autostereoscopic displays. 30. 30 years in autostereoscopic display. So this is very impressive. So we are looking very much forward to your talk. Thanks thank a lot. You. Thank you, thank you. Okay. So hello, I'm Greg Favalora, uh, here to report exciting work on optical devices for electroholography uh, from colleagues of mine at Draper, which is in uh, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So thank you to the committee for the opportunity to talk today uh, on monolithic surface emitting electroholographic optical modulators. So for many decades, engineers of three-dimensional displays have desperately needed optical modulators capable of large, deep, high quality, truly holographic video display. So today uh, I, prevent, I uh, present very promising work towards this. Um, I'll describe an optical modulator that we designed, built, and tested as what we think is a really strong candidate for a compact, high-quality uh, diffractive or holographic video display. And to our knowledge, this was the first demonstration of a monolithic surface-emitting saw modulator. And I'll remind folks what saw modulators are in a few slides. There's a lot to cover here. Um, this draws from the fields not just of autostereoscopy and electroholography, but integrated optics, which is a different beast than MEMS. So uh, there's a paper that was published in Optics Express, uh, the 20 January 2020 issue, that I invite you to, to look at if you'd like more details or uh, reference citations later. So perhaps we can all agree that autostereoscopy really needs better optical modulators. The zeitgeist of autostereo is, it's the dawn of 2020, and we're still seeking optical modulators capable of certain things. One, customers want something of reasonably arbitrary size scale. Uh, if it has to be tiled, it should have imperceptible seams. Um, also, if you want deep 3D, not just 3D, but 3 with some appreciable depth, you need numerous non-overlapping views, which is very hard, and draws upon something called space bandwidth product of the underlying modulator. The field of view has to be big enough to be useful. And of course, you want user-friendly swap, or size, weight, and power, something tablet-like and not power-hungry. Um, so I posit that there are about two paths out of the roughly 35 or so ways to make auto stereo that could work for this. Uh, one are spatially multiplex displays that have been around for about a century. Uh, recent incarnations are lenticular uh, or integral photography based and a modulator candidate for that path would be these micron or tens of micron scale pixels with really good lenses. Uh, today I'm talking about holographic displays, that is things that rely principally on diffraction phenomena for generating 3D images, for which a modulator candidate might be acousto-optic modulators, things that are continuous in space and not discretized. So what if you could just inject holographic video fringes onto a surface? This is something, um, for example, proposed by Professor Onyerol in the mid-90s where he uh, talked about simulating and did simulate a, a crystal such as lithium niobate, which is piezoelectric, um, metallized electrodes are deposited on the front surface, excited with some pretty complicated waveforms, and upon illuminating it with a laser, they simulated what kind of holograms could be uh, emitted from it. Um, similarly, on the right uh, is a device proposed by folks at groups like the MIT Media Laboratory and Brigham Young University uh, that's illuminated by an embedded optical waveguide rather than externally. So here's citations to some of the uh, MIT work uh, under Bove and Jolly and uh, Dan Smalley and their coworkers, uh, in which they envision on the far right a large tiling of so-called saw modulators, surface acoustic wave modulators, uh, in which you inject light uh, and you electrify it with many millimeters worth of a hologram. Uh, upon diffraction, it is then caused to exit total internal reflection by some optic. They propose a uh, volume grating, uh, but the technique I'll talk to you about today that we did at Draper uses a backside grating, as well as more standard uh, microfabrication techniques. So hurrying along, this is a brief, brief overview of so-called leaky mode surface acoustic wave modulators. In this type of optical modulator, there is a substrate uh, people usually use lithium niobate, which is a transparent high-index material that is also piezoelectric. 
uh, and uh, you deposit or you sort of um, cause there to be optical waveguides just below the surface so that when illuminated with laser light, we like uh, TE polarized light, the light gets trapped inside of this waveguide until something happens. So the something happens due to a group of electrodes with a fancy name, IDTs, interdigital transducers, which when you uh, electrify them with a waveform, for example, 250 megahertz, 400 megahertz, uh, it induces a surface wave in this piezoelectric material, uh, which are holograms. They zip along the surface of this crystal just like corrugated um, or corduroy pants, uh, and they fly along at 3,000 to 4,000 meters per second. When the wave-guided light uh, interacts with the surface acoustic waves, they actually polar polarization um, rotate and dip into the substrate uh, at angles that are a function of the frequency components of the drive signal. And don't worry, I'll say this all again. But the point is that you can imagine how, if arranged on its side, this is a really nice precursor to a horizontal parallax-only 3D display. So unlike a spatially multiplex display in which you need many groups of pixels, each of which is dedicated to a view, here each pixel can simultaneously project 50 or 100 views at the same time, depending on your drive signal. Now, uh, this has been around a while, not originally for holographic display. In the early 70s, people have worked with this sort of modulator. Uh, and more recently, uh, in recent decades, Smalley and Bove and others at MIT and BYU have been applying this in a variety of ways to future holographic displays. So our work at Draper has been to decrease various technologies from meter scale to tens of centimeter scale to several millimeter scale. Uh, the first thing we're doing, as I reported in last year's SDNA conference, is a sort of stepping stone. It's a group of edge emitting devices all lined up in a row to create uh, 3D imagery. But uh, perhaps with a different market appeal is a surface emitting display, something like a tablet we envision where holograms uh, float outside of the device. So we'll talk to you about the fabrication of this and the test of this device now. So again, Saw modulators, surface acoustic wave modulators, do the job of mapping the frequency components of an applied electronic waveform to output angles of light. So here you could see uh, this sort of one millimeter thick substrate of lithium niobate onto which is uh, deposited uh, some metallized electrodes, the IDTs, which happen to be a chirped electrode, uh, but we don't have to get into that right now. Uh, when you apply a input, such as a sine wave at 370 megahertz, a uh, Rayleigh wave appears on the surface of the device and scoots along it. Meanwhile, uh, if you get light into an optical waveguide just below the surface, such as through using an incoupling prism or an incoupling grating, uh, the two interact because the saw is a periodic waveform, and then it diffracts. It diffracts at a dip angle inside the substrate, uh, such that as you crank up the drive frequency, the dip angle sort of uh, changes and gets closer to grazing. So one frequency component leads to one ray direction uh, exiting into air. But if instead of applying a tone electrically, you decide to apply a chord or multiple summed sine waves, at, sine waves at once, you get several ray directions out. For example, if you apply 320 megahertz plus 370 megahertz, you get two rays at once and so on and so forth. Okay, so we reported this uh, edge emitting system at SDNA 2019, and back in the lab, uh, as I give this talk, we're busily making more of these light field projector modules which combine special fiber optic illuminators with these chips. And the YouTube um, link is given here to see that uh, discussion. Now, with that background information, I talked about how we're uh, going to announce a surface emitting modulator uh, as inspired by groups uh, at MIT and so forth. Let's get into it. So we envision a um, tiling, as do others, in a plane of these modulators. Now, surface acoustic waves have this really cool property in which the surface waves uh, propagate many millimeters before they attenuate. Um, so that means you can load in these linear holograms into a crystal and then light them up as you need them stroboscopically. You no longer need one wire and one laser beam per pixel. You can instead have centimeter scale 
holograms, uh, thereby radically decreasing the number of wires in a system. Uh, an innovation that we decided to apply to things that are in the literature is, of course, you need to get the light out of this crystal. I said it was a very high index material. Um, so to overcome TIR, we're using a sub-wavelength surface grating, which is much easier to fabricate than a proposed uh, volume Bragg grating. And uh, we insist on the team that we always rely on traditional microfab processes, such as photolithography for the IDT and e-beam lithography for the surface grating. Okay, let's get into the step-by-step -step from how you get light fields from these electronically induced holograms. Now, in, in my vernacular, the hologram is the, um, the effects in the medium that, when illuminated, produce a holographic image. So again, there is an incoupling prism, there's trapped light and optical waveguide, there's an electrode driven by an interesting signal, which induces holographic fringes that co counter propagate, and when they interact, light comes out. This is a photograph of the device. Uh, it sort of looks like a matchstick, if you see it in person, is the size scale. Uh, on the top half of this slide are snippets of the mask design in which you can see several uh, IDT electrodes. We've indicated where the optical waveguides are and also where the incoupling prism would live. Um, light interacts up here. It dips down into the substrate and beyond the plane of the display, hits some outcoupling gratings in the back and then pops out again towards you in the audience. The backside subway wave grating is something we know how to make now, but did take some process development to really uh, hammer out. We designed it in a um, available software tool called the S4 Rigorous Coupled Wave Analysis Package, and we took care to set the outgoing angle from the crystal at about 12 degrees or so to reduce uh, exit reflections from Fresnel uh, reflections. It was fabbed, as I said, in e-beam lithography, and it has a period, ideally, of roughly 360 nanometers. Um, we use spin-on glass resist with, uh, backed with silver, so it's sort of a glass and silver grating on the backside of this device. Okay, so at first you, are, uh, you set up your modulator and you inject TE polarized light into this proton exchanged optical waveguide just below the surface. Then you turn on your function generator and apply a sine wave, say, at one frequency. Uh, when they interact, the polarization is rotated and it acts as if it hit a diffraction grating or one component of a hologram and the light dips into the substrate whereupon it hits this outcoupling grating. We provide equations in the paper, by the way, to help you estimate what all these angles are so you could do it in a predictable way, uh, but typically we're seeing dip angles of the neighborhood of five to eight degrees uh, when illuminated at 640 nanometers, which is red light, uh, in the world of 250 to 400 megahertz, as I'll explain in a second. This all depends, by the way, on the cut of the lithium niobate, so our experiments use so-called X-cut Y-propagating lithium niobate. Y-propagating because you can see the saw runs along the same axis as the Y-axis. Anyhow, due to the outcoupling grating, the light is caused to emerge, and when it goes into air, you use Snell's law to figure out uh, the angle of refraction into air. To characterize these devices, we put it in an apparatus that we jokingly call C-3PO, because everything in our lab has some strange Star Wars reference associated with it. Uh, we illuminate it, excite it with um, uh, an electronic waveform, we move a detector around it radially, and then measure the response of drive frequency versus output angle. And I note that this output angle here is in sort of arbitrary lab view coordinate space, not the angle into air, and I'll explain what that means in a second. But the point is, if you excite it at one frequency, the light will principally emerge at one angle. Then you change the frequency and drive it, say, with a slightly higher tone. That will cause the dip angle to change and then exit uh, at a different angle into air. You can see that the dotted orange lines are exiting with a different angle with respect to normal than the black lines are. Also, a side issue is that they uh, emerge from a slightly different point along this modulator, which is something you need to keep track of. So here are three plots in a row showing different drive frequencies. I apologize. Uh, for not making this easier to read. So the x-axis is the soft frequency drive in megahertz. So we've got roughly, I don't know, 295 or so, and 305, and then 320-ish. And you could see that the um, angle in the apparatus coordinate space changes along with it. Now, here's an interesting thing uh, that the folks at MIT had pointed out, which is you can load up the length of this channel with a linear hologram. So you can actually compute about a centimeter or so, we haven't even tried longer than eight millimeters yet, um, with holographic patterns that move along the surface of the crystal and then you illuminate stroboscopically to freeze its 3,500 to 4,000 meter per second traversal speed. 
here's a case where we'll try loading it up with two, three, or four hogles or holographic pixels, like a tone and a brief pause and then another tone, and we'll see what happens. And as expected, uh, you can see that when you load it up with multiple signals in a row, multiple uh, holograms are induced in the crystal, and then uh, the input light is steered to a variety of angles. Now, we experimented with uh, launching various arbitrary signals into the device, uh, and as I pointed out, the exit points are a function of a variety of things, such as the spacing uh, between the signals, the angles that you're using, and also the, the timing of the saws. So here's an example, again, of four single-frequency saw bursts um, causing uh, the emission of light at four different angles. So this is the swept frequency data map of the whole thing, which you would sort of read with uh, vertical graph cuts. You can see for a variety of saw frequencies, you cause the output angles of the light to change. To see just how far we could stretch this thing and how long of a hologram we can get and how many hogles we could program into it, uh, we believe we got nine at least. So you have a tone and a space and a tone and a space and a tone and a space and so on, so that you get a collection of hogles um, that have activity and a collection that don't interspersed. And I know I'm going through a lot very quickly here, so I redirect you to the recent um, Optics Express paper about how this works. Now, uh, I also need to make a careful, honest note about the angles that are coming out of this. The size scale of the distance of our sensor to the uh, device under test was similar or small. That is, we had to be careful to disentangle um, the point of exit of the light from the angle of exit of the light. And we did that by running the experiment with two different um, sensor distances from the device under test and then doing inverse ray tracing. So the point of all this is that we got roughly 0.3 degrees of angular addressability into air. This is very modest, especially compared to an edge fire or edge emitting display. But then again, we drove it at a very modest collection of frequencies. This all resulted in 0.01 degrees into air per megahertz whereas our edge emitter work is usually has a bandwidth of roughly 100 megahertz or so. So uh, to summarize the device characterization before I get into some final points, uh, we believe this is the first ever demonstration of a monolithic or one piece uh, surface emitting saw modulator made using standard microfab techniques. Uh, the substrate was X-cut Y propagating lithium niobate and we were able to load eight millimeter long linear holograms into this first device. So it's nearly ready for tiling into an actual display. But you're probably wondering, wait a minute, how do you turn a 0 0.3 degree field of view into a useful 45 or 60 degree field of view? Well, there are other techniques we're working on. So one thing that we're proposing is to have a hybrid beam direction approach where the fine information content is provided by these RF level uh, electronic signals as I've discussed. The other is to take advantage of the fact that when light um, hits a grating, the angle of exit is partially due to the wavelength of the incident light. So we uh, propose taking a collection of light sources with fine line widths at 630 nanometers, 635 nanometers, and so forth, so that in a hybrid approach, you could use the color to steer the so-called boresight of each of these things to kind of round robin or spatially even multiplex across uh, a 10 degree field of view, while the RF information provides the fine grained information for the light field. Meanwhile, to get additional expansion from 10 degrees to up to 60 degrees, there's a variety of light field expansion techniques that one could use. For example, an array of micro telescopes as we've had to build for our edge emitting display. And these techniques are discussed in the two things we've cited below. So wrapping up, uh, surface emitting saw modulators have a number of benefits. Uh, for many decades, electroholography has been believed to provide the ultimate in display realism if only someone would go and build a real electroholographic display of appreciable size. Um, we've shown the capability of centimeter scale continuous linear holograms, not um, space discrete ones as you'd get from a pixelated SLM. You can partition it in data space however you want. So if you want your hologram to be driven with um, millimeter scale hogles, you can do that. Or if you wish you could just unroll it like lines of a linear hologram, you could pump in the data that way. And we've also today uh, disclosed this hybrid RF and wavelength based multiplexing for coarse and fine ray fan aiming. So the future steps we're going to take uh, in the exploration of the device could include 
um, arraying multiple rows at once, and also, of course, uh, experimenting with the multi-wavelength drive, and then combining it with a so-called light field conditioning stage to further expand the field of view. So that's it. Uh, thank you very, very much for your attention today. And if anyone has questions, as always, feel free to contact me at gfavalora at draper.com. Thank you very much. Okay, Greg. Thanks a lot. All right. Thanks. For this amazing talk.